thank you to my sisters and what an honour and a pleasure to be here, really. I, you know, the, the Vancouver Rape Relief and the feminists and human rights activists in this city and elsewhere in Canada are amongst my top heroes of all time. And in 2004, I wrote about Vancouver Rape Relief. In 2006, I met some of the collective in a bar in Boston. It was all very seedy. <laughs> and then eventually in 2015, I got here. And I can't thank the collective enough for hosting that visit and for introducing me to the activists, to the sex trade survivor experts, to those fighting for abolition of the sex trade. <clears throat> and it was one of the most important trips during the whole research for my book. And the research took two years, and just a tiny little bit of background before I read some short passages from it. I've been a feminist campaigner since I was 17 years old. I'm now 55. I started to prioritise almost exclusively in my writing, my research and my activism, the issue of the sex trade, just over 20 years ago. And I can't really put it in any more sophisticated terms than this. The reason why is because it's the worst thing that can happen to a woman. When we talk about male violence against women and girls, it's the worst. And I'd come to learn enough about the intersections between misogyny, colonialism, racism and class hatred to understand that this is built on gross oppression. I won't use the term inequality because it just doesn't hack it. And so when I started to research the book, I didn't come to this with a clean slate, but I certainly came to it to learn more and to be able to present the evidence, not in academic terms, not by the overuse of statistics and numbers that can easily be disproved by the other side, but to look very closely at the tactics, the methods, and the messages, the propaganda, that persuade so many of us all around the world, even those who should know better, educated people, liberal people, those that think that they're prioritising protecting the women in the sex trade. And it was clear, and <clears throat> excuse me, Hill has already foregrounded the issue about how we're blamed for our own oppression. But there's something particularly pernicious about the way that prostitution is repackaged and sanitised, which is why I've called my book The Pimping of Prostitution. It's pimp your coffee, pimp your car. Well, prostitution itself has been pimped, and it's now become something else. And everywhere I went in the world where people would make the right noises about why men abuse us, why men beat us, why men rape us as children, why female genital mutilation is so endemic, why forced and early marriage is so endemic, why sexual assault is daily and de rigueur. When you ask them what they should do to counter the problems of prostitution, they would all come back at me with the same words. More or less, the same words. Legalise it. Make it safer for the girls. Now, if I had one dollar for every time I've heard that, guess who would never be looking for funding for the women's movement again? Right? <laughs> so that's why I decided to make this book a project and raise the money to do as much travel as I could. And I did 164,000 miles in total. And I went to very many countries and did 250 interviews. And let me tell you, I will never eat airline food again for the rest of my life. My back has suffered. And although the pro-prostitution lobby have put out on social media that I was funded to do this by oil money, trust me... <coughs> trust me when I tell you if that oil money had been there, I would have taken it, right? because I was going on long-haul flights on outside toilet airlines, more or less. Right? This, this was not luxury travel. But it was a highly privileged project, and it has enriched and changed my life. But I just want to say, just want, I want to give you one tiny anecdote before I read a little bit, and then we're going to have a, a conversation far longer than I'm going to talk to you for like this. The academic community um, around the world is largely pro-sex trade, largely pro-prostitution. 
In my country, they are vicious. And elsewhere also. And the academics were the ones who really didn't want to talk to me. I got interviews with the pro-sex trade lobbyists, pimps, johns, the lot. But not really the academics. They more or less told me that they couldn't speak to me even if they wanted to, because if they were quoted in my book, they would never be able to work with the sex worker community again. This is how McCarthyite this issue has become. But the academics are their own particular brand of perniciousness, because they're, of course, stopping students who wish to do studies into the harms of the sex trade from doing their doctoral thesis, from doing their MAs in this, because they know that they'll be marked down. We know this from the fact that when really esteemed senior academic colleagues of mine who happen to think prostitution is an atrocity have their papers sent out for peer review, they just get red penned all the way through because it's about the Nordic model or it's about the arms of the sex trade. So the academics, when they realised that I was being published and that this really was going to go ahead because I put the cover of my book up on social media, I mean, no one had seen a word of this. This was months before it was published. My publisher started to get a ream of telephone calls and emails from the academics saying, if she libels us, we will sue her. Now, who pays $600 to get a lawyer to write a letter to say, if she libels us, we will sue her? Aside from the fact that I'm a journalist, very well versed in libel law, I know how not to libel people. But more than that, I don't need to libel or defame these people. They do it. I mean, the, seriously, <laughs> the, the material that I have, I really don't need to get myself in court to discredit them. They do it very well themselves. So the publishers decided that a huge amount of money, and this never happens with this publisher, spend a huge amount of money to get a legal read of the entire book, which was 125,000 words. And it was going to cost, in sterling, 1,500 pounds, so about 2,300 Canadian dollars. And they asked me to pay for it, and I said no. They said, but the author's responsible for making sure that there's no defamatory remarks. I said, there are no defamatory remarks. <clears throat> so they get a lawyer on, and I'm not allowed to know who the lawyer is. But I find out who the lawyer is, because it's a small world. <laughs> and this man clearly had a view on the sex trade, just like the people who say legalise it, make it safer for the girls. And he didn't do a legal read. He actually did a proofread. He rearranged all my sentences. He put in pretty much every sentence, it could be argued that, perhaps. <laughs> and he told me that it was going to rack cause hackles to rise if I use words and terms like pro-prostitution lobby, like sex trade apologists. And I said, but that's what they are, so I'll continue to use that. Then he said, well, you shouldn't really name names with these academics because they might sue. And I said, well, try to do that, but they won't get anywhere. And he then sent this message back via the publisher saying, well, what we want to do is for you to be cautious. And I went, whoa, cautious? You think we've got where we are today in the women's movement by being cautious? Are you serious? And he says, well, what we really want to make sure is that nobody has enough material to get you into court. And I said, no, here's how it's going to work. How we're going to do this is to make sure that if they get us into court, they won't win. Because if they try and do that, we will have the best show in town. Right, so bring it on. So he was getting desperate by this time. He actually said Amnesty International would sue because I released all of the papers from, that were leaked to me in 2014 about their policy. And I said, sue, how? And then he came back and said, Thomas Cook, the travel agent, will sue. <laughs> and I said, Thomas Cook, the travel agent. And I looked back at the reference, and it was an example about how normalised the sex trade had become in the Netherlands, where brothel prostitution is legal, so that Thomas Cook had even set up tours around the red light area where under threes go for free. And they'd even responded to those of us that wrote about it in the newspapers at the time. But how are they going to sue now? OK, so this was his last ditch attempt to try and curtail me and to try and score points with the publishers by saying, I found at least three points that she could be sued for. I put a sentence in there, we've all said it, we all know it very well. Not all men pay for sex, but all men benefit from it. 
He underlined and put a big question mark and an asterisk around, all men? (laughs) So I wrote back and said, if the lawyer thinks all men might sue me, (laughs) I will get all women (laughs) and we will go to court and we will fight it and it will take rather a long time. So the academics tried to get the book pulped before it came out and before a word had been written. For every one of these books that we write, about 40 are written by them. Students are being fed a diet of guff, of nonsense, of lies and of propaganda. And the first chapter that I want to read from is chapter three, Sanitising the Sex Trade. Because we know, as I said earlier, and many in this room have lived it, we're told that this is something that it's not, that it's liberating. The sanitisation project began with the introduction of the term sex work, now used by the majority of police officers, media outlets and human rights organisations. There are even those who use the term juvenile sex work to describe sexually abused children. The sanitisation of language to describe the sex trade and activities associated with it has reached what I hope is a nadir. The term forced sex work has become widely used among some international non-governmental organisations, including, for example, ActionAid, which strikes me as an oxymoron. If we are to take the intended meaning of sex work to engage in sex as labour, Surely the sex part of the work is forced. That means it's rape. Or slavery. Or both. Indeed, ActionAid's paper on the topic is entitled Position Paper on the Rights of Sex Workers and is written by the international women's rights teams. The only rights considered within this framework appear to be those of women to be prostituted. Now let's look at how far back this goes, because this isn't a new phenomenon. And I use something called LexisNexis, a newspaper database, to look at the very first time certain words and terms were used. A 1984 article published in the Associated Press, a Californian newspaper, with the headline, Cops Survey Finds Hookers Well Paid and Enjoy Their Work, is a clear example of how confused and contradictory, as well as biased, much reporting on the issue of prostitution is. The article was based on the findings of a San Jose police officer with a master's in criminology who had conducted a survey of 100 prostituted women around Silicon Valley. According to the researcher, the women earn $74,000 a year. This is in 1984, everybody. They enjoy their work and they don't worry about getting caught. So far, so good. However, further findings highlighted the article contradicted this rosy picture. One of these surveyed, sorry, of these surveyed, 88% admitted that prostitution is related to other crimes, including robbery, assault and murder. The majority of the women included in in the survey said that they preferred Johns who were married because the Johns who were not married are more likely to go to the police if they're robbed by their pimps. According to Martinelli, the cop, the researcher, only 2% of the women surveyed were pimped or otherwise coerced. 2%. Some 71% said they liked their work, despite the fact that almost all of the women were children when they were first prostituted. 21% said they entered prostitution, quote, for excitement and to meet interesting people. A common trajectory, obviously. (laughs) One of the most telling statistics that came out of the survey was that only 5% said that they entered prostitution to support a drug habit, although most said that they have since turned to narcotics because of the easy availability and to help reduce the stress of their work, unquote. A common argument that has long been used by the pro-prostitution lobby is that women enter street prostitution primarily to pay for drugs. Those of us who understand the harm that's inherent to the sex trade have long argued that many women turn to drugs because of the horrors they have to deal with prostitution. So rosy with the claims by Martinelli that even so-called sex workers' rights activists took issue with some of the statements. Priscilla Alexander, already a major figure in the pro-prostitution movement, and at the time that article was published, 
Action Coordinator for the National Organization of Women in California, said that the figure of $74,000 average earnings was hugely inflated and was actually closer to $15,000. So we can see how long this has been going on. And when the movement was very young, the sex workers' movement, in the, the, the early 1980s, people fell on this like rabid dogs. It was music to their ears, if they wanted, to be convinced that this, there was nothing wrong with this. This wasn't a human rights abuse or a social ill. And of course, we know that language is hugely important in sanitising the sex trade. The most important way to sanitise any human rights abuse is to rename it. For example, as Janice Raymond points out in her book, not a choice, not a job. A pro-slavery strategist in the West Indies suggested, instead of slaves, let the Negroes be called assistant planters, and we shall not then hear such violent outcries against the slave trade by pious divines, tender-hearted poetesses, and short-sighted politicians. Language is a powerful weapon in the ideological battle over prostitution. The term sex worker entered popular parlance following the publication of Sex Work, Writings by Women in the Sex Industry in 1987. Today in the UK and elsewhere, the term is used by police officers, policy makers, politicians and human rights organisations. Most media outlets also favour it over prostitution. The evolution of sex workers' rights language has had a profound effect on how the sex trade is viewed by the general public. In 2012, I attended the first international conference organised by PROSPOL, which is funded by the European Commission to the tune of millions of euros. And it's supposed to be comparing prostitution policies in Europe. It was held in Vienna, Australia. And I was one of three delegates out of 168 that thought there was anything problematic at all about prostitution. It was a party of blanket decriminalisation, activists academics, students, many of them from Nevada University. I felt like a vegan at a, a butcher's convention. Um, <laughs> delegates had been invited to submit papers under the conference banner, Troubling Prostitution, Exploring Intersections of Sex, Intimacy and Labour. On the flight, I'd read the book of abstract in details, my eyes growing wider as I ploughed through headings such as Between Love and Work, Negotiations of economic and intimate ties among sex workers and pimps. And the trafficking of sex work, migration working conditions and exploitation. At the conference I attended a number of workshops and keynote speeches that were peppered with the type of euphemisms that served to destroy the reality of the sex trade were held. And I'm just going to read you, just briefly, some of these euphemisms that were in the papers, more than one abstract, used well more than one time in speech. Contract breach means rape. Business practices is pimping. Facilitate disabled people's sex lives means disabled men buying sex. Occupational health risks, violence, sexually transmitted diseases and rape. Job amenities, the ability or non-ability to turn down undesirable clients. Effective erotic performances performed by prostitutes, sex acts, third parties, pimps, sex work management, pimping, grooming gangs, pimps who target girls under the age of 18, international marriage community, male order brides. And what was horrific about the abstract papers and the, the talks at all of these different workshops and keynotes talks were the words coerce, victim, trafficking and survivor were put in scare quotes in the conference materials. And this is how powerful language is. And it's just slipped into common parlance. So later I want to be a bit more optimistic, talk about the future of the abolitionist survivor-led movement. But for now, it would be really good if we could have a discussion about the issues raised in not just the book and this reading, but the issues that you yourselves work with. Thank you. The, 
book, of course, is about prostitution, but it's also very much about female autonomy and particularly female sexual autonomy. So as one of my favorite lesbians, I can't help but take the moment, Julie, to ask you if lesbianism as a liberatory, not as it's currently practiced, but as a liberatory female practice is to survive, what needs to happen? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, look, until men learn to behave properly and get their acts together, then clearly lesbianism is a great choice for women. Um, and, you know, the, the, the times that I've been in bars and men start hitting on you and they, they start off with, hello, girls, can we join you? You're on your own. And we point out there's three of us, so we're not quite on our own. Um, <laughs> And then it quickly becomes uh, lesbians and then slags and then back to lesbians again. And, you know, it's, when I came out at 15, I was at school being called alternately lesbian and slag, and I figured lesbian was the better option. <laughs> hi, there. hi, Julie. Um, hi. My name's Elizabeth, and I'm an ex-collective member of, with Vancouver Rape Relief. Um, you mentioned you did a lot of travel for this particular book. Um, if you were able to uh, notice or draw any conclusions or kind of uh, general um, revelations or ideas about how um, the industry of prostitution functions differently um, comparatively from, from you know, North America to Europe and um, in these places where prostitution has been legalized and, and entrenched for, um, for a very long time, how that's um, different from, um, for example, uh, one thing that I noticed being in France or in the UK, that there were a lot of women being trafficked from Eastern Europe, um, which is you know, slightly different from the case here in, in North America. And maybe if you just speak to kind of the, the international differences or similarities that you might have seen. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I spent a lot of time looking at these different regimes, but by being in the countries and being in the brothels and talking to the women, talking to the sex buyers, talking to the pimps, talking to people who lived around in the, the locality, because we're, talk we're really looking here at raising children under a regime that says prostitution is just like buying a burger or prostitution is not acceptable in any society striving for equality. And that's, there you have the difference between, for example, the Netherlands that you've just mentioned and Sweden that introduced the law criminalising demand and decriminalising prostituted people in 1999. I spent a lot of time in, in the Netherlands. I went backwards and forwards to Amsterdam. I even went on one of those one-to-one -one tour guides um, to find out what the, the tour guide was telling people about the sex trade and about legalisation and about the women. And it was classic. I mean, this, you know, I paid 30 euros and he walked me around and he told me all this nonsense about how legalization has reduced numbers of women being pimped overseas into the brothels, that the women are safer, that the women aren't pimped, that the women are happy, that there's no violence, that there's full condom use, that the police are happy with it. Stuff that even the police and the local politicians have since 2003 been saying has not worked in the Netherlands and is pulling back and is also already partially pull it, pulled back by introducing new clauses that won't get very far until they introduce the abolitionist model, but they've shut down half the window brothels in De Wallen, the, the main area. And one thing that was very telling about this tour guide was where he got his information from. He had been briefed by the Prostitute Information Centre, which has an office in the Red Light District. And this is run by a formerly prostituted woman turned pimp, turned business entrepreneur, who runs a business by inviting tourists, some sex tourists, some curious tourists, to go to her, the, the office to be told a load of lies about how great prostitution is under legalisation. It's unbelievable. This is exactly the propaganda machine. It's not a conspiracy, it's a business. So this tour guide is telling me this, but he's telling people that really will absorb this and believe it. 
I then went back for the very final time for this research with um, a sex trade survivor um, activist called Fiona Broadfoot, a Brit who I've known for over 20 years. And she'd never been. And she wanted to come with me to do some interviews. And so we walked around the... Uh, the window brothel area, which most local people just walk past with their heads down, unless they're sex buyers. It's, it's vile. And Dutch women are so rare in these windows that when there is a Dutch woman in a brothel, they have an NL for the Netherlands sticker on the window. And you see pimps in, in gangs. You know, I know a pimp when I spot one. Just because he's now called a manager under legalisation doesn't make any difference. So Fiona and I saw a young man handsome young man standing against one of the window brothels, smoking a cigarette, waiting for his friend to come out who was inside paying for sex. And he agreed to speak to us and be interviewed. And he said he'd first paid for sex when he was 12 years old. And he said, oh, I know you're, suppo you're shocked, but that's because it's not legal in your country. It's not legal in the US, but it's legal here. My dad took me, there's nothing wrong with it. And we were talking afterwards, Fiona and I, and Fiona said, he's, he was, that was sexual abuse, that was child abuse. That young man at 12 was, was abused. Mm -hmm. And we said, but who'd abused him? Because the prostituted woman hadn't abused him. Because she was being sexually abused too. And it was the culture <coughs> of normalisation and legalisation that had sexually abused that child and in turn abused that woman. It's horrific. In Germany, the brothel of Europe, you're talking about mega brothels where men can go in and pay 60 euros, buy a beer and a burger and bang all you can. That's the advert. So in what way does this mean that women under legalisation have any say over what sexual services they perform, over the johns that they see, over the brothel owner and, and his or her actions? It's hell. The women will tell you it's hell. In Nevada where in, I think it's six or eight counties, there are legal brothels, many of whom are owned by Dennis Hoff, the uber pimp who graces our TV screens doing a big propaganda show. I can't remember the name of this fly-on-the-wall TV programme, but it's something like The Bunny Ranch, and it shows, it's just entertainment showing the women having a great time. I went into to a brothel. Dennis Hoff let me go to his brothels for a, for a week to do tours, he hadn't googled me, he figured, <laughs> he figured that all publicity was good publicity, it didn't quite work out like that. So I went to talk to one woman, clearly these women were not stupid and they were not brainwashed, but they had been told, you know, you're going to talk to this journalist, you better say you're having a great time. So one woman was in her room and she invited me to speak with her in there and she was posed on the bed, as if expecting a John. And on the wall, there was a big pornographic photograph of her. You know, like we all have in our bedrooms, don't we? <laughs> and there were just some, what the women call hooker shoes, by the side. And there were no personal things at all. And I mean, compared to my bedroom, you would be able to work out everything about me if you saw my bedroom. <laughs> So when she was just telling me the usual, she enjoys it, it's great, it's fantastic, she earns loads of money, she's never had a bad John, and I'm looking outside and I can see the barbed wire over the, the high fence, and I know that she's not allowed out unless she's with an assistant pimp, and I know that the women have to have compulsory blood tests by law to work there every Friday to make sure the Johns don't catch any nasty diseases to take back to their wife, because guess what, they're not wearing condoms. And as she's telling me that this is all great, I said, oh, it's interesting, your room is so clear of any personal things. Um, do you not have them with you? Because the women live there for months. And she hesitated and she opened a drawer on the bedside and took out a framed photograph of a beautiful little girl who she said was her daughter. And she said, I have my things, this is my daughter, but I don't want them seeing her and I don't want their spermy hands touching her. And that told me everything I needed to know. Because I'm not going to say to the woman, but you must have been raped. But it must be awful. I mean, we're not going to, to say that to women. But you hear things. Under the, the, the Nordic model, in countries where women are not for sale, where the Johns are stigmatised and criminalised, and where the women are decriminalised, it's not perfect. 
but it's as near damn it, and it's the only alternative to prohibition where the women are arrested as well as the Johns. And the only other alternative to that is New Zealand. And New Zealand has been held up as a gold-plated model, as organic farming instead of battery farming. This, this is how it's, it's sold. The pro-prostitution lobby have stopped hailing legalisation as successful because it's been a clear failure. So they start talking about decriminalisation and it's no different. The form that you have to fill in to get a licence for a brothel is exactly half the length, three pages, as the form you fill in in my country to adopt a rescue dog or cat. It's horrific. There are the all-inclusive deals, just like in Germany, and prostitution survivors who have been prostituted under prohibition and who campaigned for decriminalisation, believing the promises that it would be good for the women, and now starting to speak out. So that's the good news. So I know that you have uh, been threatened to be no platformed when you've um, attempted to speak in academic institutions or you have been no platformed in these institutions. And um, I, when you're speaking about the ways that academia is preventing any sort of research um, into anything that might be critical of prostitution, uh, it's definitely scary. Um, and my question is, is um, in an academic environment where increasingly um, students uh, and professors alike will prevent uh, speakers from speaking um, in an academic institution, which is supposed to be a place of uh, debate and free exchange <coughs> of ideas. Uh, what, what can we do, um, what can the women's movement do to ensure that um, that that environment is, is protected in, in order for our voices to be heard at, at that level? Thank you for that question. Um, Back in the UK, some of the radical feminists have a strategy which is when one of us are no platformed, and let's just get these semantics clear, we're not just not offered a platform, that's fine. I'm not offered a platform at, the, at Buckingham Palace on a regular basis. <laughs> this is when we've been invited by academic staff and the venue and the administration has been bullied into cancelling us or cancelling the venue. There is a huge difference between not being invited and then being cancelled and humiliated and, and bullied out, right? So the strategy that we have is when one of us is cancelled in this way, that we will put on that person, and it's unfortunately usually me, so people get to hear me a lot, in another venue. So we find a venue where we won't be cancelled. And then we help the people understand who are running the venues that they are going to get hell from some quarters if they agree to, uh, to hire the place to us. And we've even asked them to sign agreements that they won't cancel. We've, we've had to put all kinds of clauses in. We have to find our own venues. We have to never, ever cancel an event, ever. We, we must never, ever do that. There have been some feminists who put on the kind of more careful, liberal feminist events back home and all well intended who maybe don't invite one or two of us to speak in case they then get cancelled and lose their money. Well, then we'll just have to crowdfund and get a new venue. We mustn't give in to this. Students must be able to hear what's happening in the world, and they must have an alternative view to what's become the orthodoxy. And I get calls and emails and messages from students all the time saying, we really wanted you at my university, but they just sent round a, 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 you know, an email saying that you are your own trigger warning and that you will make students unsafe just by stepping on campus. They're doing this to radical feminists who speak about male violence. Men don't get this anywhere near as much as we do. Anywhere near as much. It is merely an anti-feminist backlash and vicious misogynistic men's movement. That's what it is. And often, you know, th these individuals do not represent what they're supposed to represent. The small group of trans activists that are the vicious misogynists do not represent trans people. 
and the so-called sex workers' rights activists that scream whorephobe at us really do not represent people in prostitution. They just don't. And I have to say, I feel a little bit embarrassed that there's only eight people outside tonight. <laughs> <coughs> I don't know, maybe I'm losing my touch, maybe, but the last time that I was picketed when I was doing a talk and it was for in the north of England and, and it was, I was reading from, from my book and I could hear them all screaming outside and it was the usual, what my partner calls queer ISIS because they're all just foot soldiers, it was nonsense, the orange fringes were dyed, they were polyamorous, it was all going on. <laughs> And they were holding up these placards and shouting, blow jobs or no jobs, blow jobs or no jobs. And I thought, wow, you know, we used to be so much more inventive than that. And, and then I looked over and I thought, this is a classic. This placard will go down in history. And it was, Bindle isn't peer reviewed. <laughs> was, wow. I can't hang on to my career or reputation with that placard. So we, we absolutely have to be as brave as possible. But what that requires is never to leave women standing alone who are going through this. You see, the Liberals, I'm afraid, have got us into this mess. Because if the Liberals had seen what was happening to those few of us back in the day, it started with me in 2004, I blame Vancouver Rape Relief, obviously. Um, <laughs> if the Liberals had stood up and said, oh, this just looks like misogyny, rather than, oh, well, we don't like those nasty radical feminists anyway, then we wouldn't be in this state. And now, of course, many liberals are saying, this is just vicious, nasty, hateful misogyny. But we're already quite a bit down that line. So I think we put on as many talks as we can, and we try and support students and other young people who want to hear this. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm a member of uh, Vancouver Rape Relief and Women's Shelter. Um, I, you mentioned that you wanted to talk about something hopeful uh, tonight, and so my question is, during your trips, what was um, the most surprising, positive surprising, or um, something that you sought from the abolitionist fight from each country, what um, message did you get that was hopeful? That it's really growing. <laughs> and the reason why I interviewed 50 sex trade survivor activists for this book is because this isn't me repeating women's words. This is, these are the words of the women who are leading this movement, saying, we've had enough, we're the experts, we can tell you about the police, about the Johns, about the brothels, about the effects, about the roots in, about the roots out, about what we need for exiting, about how legalization's never going to work, about why we need the Johns to be criminalized, and crucially, about why we could never say this when we were in the sex trade. So, the most optimistic message from the whole of the book, which is why the subtitle is Abolishing the Sex Work Myth, is because this is the abolitionist movement of today that will succeed. And abolitionist campaigners, feminists, and other human rights allies that are with us in this struggle are finally listening to the women and men who have been in this trade. And it is a hundred times harder, and I can say this because it's been said to me over and over again by survivors. This is a hundred times harder than standing up and saying, I was sexually abused during my childhood. I was raped by my work colleague. And the reason why it's harder is because of the stigma associated with this and because sex trade survivors are told that they are liars and that they are mad. All kinds of horrendous bullying and slandering goes on from the so-called progressives, who are the pimp lobby, the sex workers' rights lot. So it's harder, which is why the fact that this movement is vibrant and growing, and growing in countries where there is legalization, like Germany, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Australia, is amazing. And these are the women who are leading the fight with allies next to them, to go to politicians, to do the education, to work with the social workers, to do primary prevention with young women. The women, some of the women that I interviewed here in Vancouver. It's an amazing movement. And in all, all the decades of feminist activism that I've been through, I've never seen such a determined and vibrant movement. 
And it'll grow much faster now than it has been over the last 10 years in particular, but since the, the, the mid-80s when Evelina Giobbi started off Whisper, Women Hurting Systems of Prostitution in Revolt. Um, the one thing that I will say is the biggest message of hope is that we're the only ones saying that we will end this sex trade and that we can end the sex trade. Because other people, however well-meaning and well-educated and who should know better, almost laugh when you say that. So when you say we must end racism, yeah, yeah. we must end colonialism, mm -hmm. we must end child sexual abuse, people don't go, whoa, well, okay, well, we'll never end it, but let's just make it a little bit better, <laughs> ever. <laughs> we must end the sex trade. What? You think you can end, end it? <laughs> yeah, like E-N-D. <laughs> right. This can, how could you ever end, how? So I say, well, in that men aren't going to simultaneously combust if they can't get their rocks off when they want to with whom they want. Women definitely don't need it. If we didn't have patriarchy, it would survive. It wouldn't survive because it would be starved of oxygen. So it's reliant on colonialism, racism and misogyny and structural oppression with men as the sex class and women as the sex class. You know, that kind of analysis you understand when we're talking about equal pay, right? <laughs> oh, they say. So you think that, that, that there won't always be women wanting to sell and men wanting to buy? I say, that's right. <laughs> right. And so... <laughs> so how would you end it? And I say, well, how would you end racism? Because you said that this has to be ended. And so you just have to keep pushing away at people. And this is what the survivor abolitionists are saying. This has to end. This can never be contained. This can never be legislated against in any way. You just have to end it. And now we have more countries that have adopted the abolitionist model of criminalizing the demand then we have legalization and decriminalization. Now the urgent thing is decriminalizing the prostituted person. It's a disgrace to criminalize prostituted people. This has to be our urgent job right now. But in the meantime, the message is getting through and it really is because of the sex trade survivors speaking out. The only culture I want to talk about when we look at how we can break these structures is patriarchy. That good old-fashioned word. Because we have this ingrained and normalised in every single culture, every single country apart from those where re-education is a process along with the criminal justice system. Such as those countries like Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, Sweden, Norway, Finland, South Korea partially, um, and France where it's recognised that this is a human rights abuse and not conducive with any uh, equal society. Um, I, I went to, um, I visited Gujarat and travelled to a village called Wadia, um, right up um, in, in the mountains near, near Rajasthan, where prostitution, uh, the village is built on prostitution. It's um, intergenerational. Um, it is completely overlooked by the law enforcers because, of course, you know, prostitution isn't legal. It has become part of the cultural landscape. And the women aren't okay with, with being prostituted. I met a man, I wasn't allowed to talk to the women, but the women were scurrying around, hiding their faces. And <clears throat> I talked to the NGOs afterwards, which was another shocking thing. I met the main pimp who was prostituting his mother, his aunt, his sister, and his daughter. And this, this is seen somehow um, as quirky by white visitors. I mean, nobody visits this village. It's bandit country. It's really dangerous. I had to have two, two local minders with me, and, um, and I was very heavily policed. But no, no one's okay with this except for the pimps and the Johns who visit from as far away as Pakistan and, and Rajasthan. So how do we break this? Well, one NGO um, that is, supposedly has an expertise in nomadic cultures within, within this particular region 
visited the elders, so in other words, the men who were pimping the women, and asked about this problem and how they could break the cycle. And it was agreed that in order to keep the women out of prostitution, girls at 13 would be married to older men in polygamous arrangements and that they would have a group marriage in the village. So a whole load of 13-year-old girls were married off to men who then raped them and prostituted them at the same time. So the NGOs clearly needed a little lesson in how to deal with issues of sexual exploitation. And if this is the only income of the village, then this is an income that men are controlling and women are not, which is fairly similar to places in the global south where men have control of the money and women are living in poverty. And so prostitution clearly isn't the answer. And as far as I'm concerned, um, if I as a white person were to put this down to well, this is just accepted within this culture, I would be doing the biggest disservice to my sisters of colour and native sisters because we know it's an imposition of colonialism and white powerful men. And so they're the structures that we need, that we need to attack. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Julie. My Hi. name's Kim. I'm a longtime activist in both the women's movement and the labour movement here. And I just want to uh, preface my question with um, part of what's, I, I suppose, shocked me because I thought better of those movements um, and horrified me is the level at which the discussion around legalization of prostitution is done insidiously in the back rooms before it ever comes to the fore so that in fact, organizations and their membership never get an opportunity to have a debate around these issues. Um, recently, I experienced that in the pro-choice movement, which I've been involved in since I was 18 years old, and um, that it was used as a platform to take that position. When I challenged the organization and said, this is something the membership has not agreed to, they said, well, you know, we didn't want to take it to the annual general meeting because we knew there'd be debate, so we, we pulled it away from there. I, I thought, well, that at least that's honest. Um, but one of the other things that I saw recently, and I'm interested in your, your international experience with this, is I went to a women's conference prior to our last federal election for the union that I belong to, or belonged to. Uh, they have recently kicked us out. Apparently, we're a little bit, bit too uppity. Um, and on the agenda were a number of workshops, one of which was uh, one that I attended, had this very nicely, very expensively produced booklet on women's issues that should be put forward during the federal election. And lo and behold, in that booklet was the legalization of prostitution. Now, I'm a member of this union, and I don't remember us ever taking a policy discussion or resolution on this issue, so I was rather surprised. Only to find out that, in fact, the booklet was actually from a, provided by a special coalition, not produced by my union. And when I went to research who this coalition was, it was almost impossible to find out who they were. Um, so I then questioned some of the leadership in our union. Uh, and one uh, uh, reaction I got was a great deal of defensiveness, but the other from women in my own locale was they knew nothing about this. Right. So um, <clears throat> that's why I say I'm shocked and horrified at how organizations that have supposedly had a tradition of democracy have now done everything they can to ensure that there is no democracy in order to force this kind of agenda. I'm interested in whether or not you had the opportunity to connect with people in the labor movement in other countries and what they are doing with this issue. Mm. Yes, thank you. It, the, our unions are so crucial in this struggle. And we lost some ground back in the UK in 2002 when the pro-pimp lobby persuaded our biggest uh, union, the GMB, a very traditional uh, union, I think it's the General Boilermakers Union. So it used to be manual labour and it used to be mainly men. And the sex workers' rights lot persuaded 
the powers that be that they should have a branch, a sex workers branch. And like all of the unions I've looked at all over the world, in the global north and the global south, they're made up mainly of a few erotic dancers, as I described, and the rest are johns, pimps and academics. Seriously. So the GMB um, got its union and then the campaigning wing of that union called itself the International Union of Sex Workers, the IUSW. And people would think when they went around preaching to the Royal College of Nurses and re other really crucial groups that we need on side, they heard the term union and they thought, ah, this is, this is that branch, it's the union branch. And they were just complete propagandists. I mean, they had 100 members at its height and about a third of them were academics studying the sex trade. So you have to blow that wide open. And feminist activists in those unions did that. And in fact, I did a big investigation alongside a woman called Kath Elliott, who was really active in the union movement, who just went to all of her colleagues and said, do you realize what we found? The IUSW is run by an anti-union, conservative voting pimp called Douglas Fox. It's the same wherever you go. The Red Thread in the Netherlands, supposedly representing 25,000 prostituted people, funded by the government to carry on rolling out the propaganda. 100 people at its height had government funding pulled from it, folded. Again, represented a few erotic dancers and some gay BDSM men who are not representative, re representative at all. So what we need to do is make connections with our unions and ask them questions. How on earth can you serve women if you are pro-sex trade and if you have so-called sex workers as part of the labor movement when the majority of women that go to union reps for support, it's for sexual harassment, isn't it? Which is what prostitution is, right? So we need to really make as many connections as possible and also to highlight as often as we can the class prejudice in this trade. Just the, the fact that these, that these white privileged men and women with various degrees and highly paid jobs think it's all right for a certain class of women to be used in this way whilst they get on in their ivory towers. So I think, yes, it's, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but I'm acknowledging that it's a really crucial part of our movement. Um, hi, Julie. Hi. Um, I'm a Korean radical feminist who is currently studying in gender studies in Vancouver. And as you can imagine, it's a very lonely process. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's really nice to see you and connect with some other radical feminists. And I'm currently writing a paper for a class, um, a critique of the sex worker model from the radical perspective. And obviously, I don't get a lot of support. Um, so for that, I really thank your book. I'm reading a lot. <laughs> yeah. My question is the questions I've got in my class. Two questions. One is, do we have to separate and distinguish trafficking and prostitution? Second one, can we dis do we have to distinguish um, the sex and um, prostitution with other types of sexual labor, such as strip, strip clubs, massage parlors, and in South Korea, like karaoke helpers who help the men to entertain themselves. Can we distinguish that? Like, yeah. It's an interesting question. I don't talk about trafficking in my book. I talk about um, international pimping, which is what, what it is, or, or just pimping within borders. Trafficking is merely a process. It doesn't actually exist as a thing. And I know that's going to sound odd coming from an anti-sex trade campaigner, but it, it really has done such huge harm. I wish I'd never heard the word trafficking, ever. And I support my brothers and sisters who describe themselves as sex trafficking survivors because it's their choice and it's their right. But I wish we didn't use the term. The, the, the term that I use, um, the time that I will talk about trafficking is when we talk about trafficking denialists who, who say migration for sex work. And you know they're, they're dismissing the fact that women are pimped internationally across borders and people make money from them. And often you know, they're in hellish conditions because of, of, of additional human rights violations that occur. 
Um, but I think that the trafficking movement gained such traction because people were able to say, oh God, we found something we can condemn about men paying for sex. Th that, that's bad. Right? The children, that's bad. All of this in the middle, no, that's all fine. And you say, well, why do you think that these international pimps do what they're doing? Because they're just bringing the women into the sex trade. So it would be like campaigning to end domestic homicide, but not worrying about domestic violence. And that's the way I see it. Um, so I, I always just talk about the sex trade. And, and I wonder why we would be more concerned about Emma from Britain being prostituted in a London brothel, um, or Svetlana from Eastern Europe, who's next door to her. In terms of the strip club issue, well, many of the sex trade survivors who were in the movement and who I interviewed and who I'm colleagues with told me that they were prostituted through the process of it being sold as erotic dancing and stripping. And of course, the brothel owners and the, you know, the, the strip club owners, they're the same scumbags. You know, they, they move the women around to get fresh meat for the punters. They, they set up a conducive context in which women are pretty much hard pressed to say no to men when they, they're approach for sexual services. Hi, Julie. Um, I, I wanted to um, make sure I make a point just in case it isn't obvious that the fact that our city and our province and our country is refusing to enforce criminalization against men prostituting women is a huge problem for us, not only because of the destitute women who are being um, tortured with that refusal, but also because it's a warning to women like me that what we've achieved in criminalizing abusive husbands and what we've achieved in criminalizing rape is under threat as well. There is no doubt in my mind that the refusal to criminalize prostitution as violence against women speaks loudly of a threat in which there will be no criminalization of violence against women. It's already true that we can't get proper application of the laws against the abuse men do in their families, on the job, on the street. And so this fight is a fight at the bottom of that structure. We have to win this fight of enforcing the law against men buying sex because it's the fundamental form of this violence against women. Uh, if we yield on this, if we allow language to defeat us on this, if we let men bullshit us on this, if we let the authorities get away with refusing to enforce a law we got, we got it. We, then we, have, we don't have a hope in hell of getting them to arrest men who are killing their wives at home. Yeah, yeah. And there's one other point I'd like to make. I think everybody is raising the question, how are we going to do it? But I, I think uh, times have changed. There is nothing short of seriously refusing to be tame, of seriously mm -hmm. refusing to be ruled. We have to make trouble now. I'm, I'm, I'm long past the thought that convincing the mayor is an issue. We need to make it fucking impossible right. for him to run the city. Right. We need to make it impossible for those police chiefs to sit in that meeting today and dare to debate whether they have to carry out the law. What kind of bullshit is that? How come we're not in revolt tonight? Yeah. So, you know, I'm looking for everybody in this room. This is the room that's convinced. This is the room where women have to actually start doing something much more troublesome. This is time for locks. This is time for glue in locks. This is time for graffiti. This is time for mass demonstrations in the street. This is time for letters to the editor from everybody tomorrow about today's meeting of the police. How dare they? Right. Right. Yeah. 
it's true, the era of keyboard warriors is definitely at an end, and we need to get on the streets, and we need to be visible with our placards and our loudailers and our banners. I couldn't agree more. And we need to make alliances with as many progressive groups and convince them that this is an issue for them too. Um, and, you know, I suppose we need to just lower the bar a little bit sometimes, and we need to be with people visibly that recognise that this is an absolute abomination. When I was a, ve a very new feminist, I went along with the anti-porn group. I was probably about 18 or something. And we approached a group of anarchists. And, you know, they just weren't really particularly bothered about porn. <laughs> and, and, and they said, well, no, we, you know, we don't want to be bothering with your bourgeois feminist stuff. You know, we're going to, we're going to glue um, a few locks on, on fur coat shops. So I said, oh... Well, we'll help you do that if you come and smash a few windows of pawn shops with us. I said, because animals get abused in porn too. They went, right, come on. <laughs> Hi, Julie. I want to ask, I think it's a follow-up to Aaron's comment and also um, what Lee was saying. What specific kinds of trouble you would recommend young women and um, particularly students to make because I think we're all very terrified at, you know entering jobs and mm -hmm. um, in universities of getting kicked out of school or not being employable because you know if we speak out someone's we're going to get a huge mob you know calling our employers and things like that what kind of specific strategies would you recommend, particularly for young women that are in that position? Do it en masse. They can't sack all of us. They can't criminalise all of us. They can't single out individuals if we're doing it en masse. We, you know, we can't just let some women take the heat while others say, oh, but what about my middle-class career that I'm looking forward to? You know, we've got lawyers. We've got pro bono lawyers. We can, do, we can rattle tins and, and get some money together and, and, and you know, do some defending and class actions and just do it. I mean, you know, some of us have less to lose than others. But I think that the ones who are the, the least vocal on this are the ones who are looking forward to a nice, cosy, easy life. Well, here's some news. It won't actually make any difference if you're raped and murdered on the way home and nobody gets justice because, you know, your class and your privilege and the job that you're looking forward to won't make any difference at all. So I think we need to stop letting the less privileged women take the heat because they're the ones that mainly are doing this. And my old friend, late friend, Andrea Dworkin, the great feminist campaigner and writer, said once in an interview with me when I asked, why is it we're women, those of us in the movement, we've come to the movement because we've been raped and abused and racially you know, marginalised and all of these things that have happened to us. And she said, because... All women are on a leash. It's called patriarchy. And the women on the shortest leash, so the woman who's been raped as a child, who's being prostituted, who's poor, she does the most. Well, we have to change that, really. Hi, Julie. My name is Jindy. I appreciate your work. Um, I, I understand and I believe strongly that this issue is solved at the structural and institutional level. And at the same time, I agree that we need to do more in our everyday lives to build alliances with people who might not be there yet in terms of being willing to put themselves on the line and, and um, fully understand how exploitative and oppressive prostitution is. I have, a, I have a problem, a hard time engaging in those conversations, and one of the things that I really admire um, and try to model is how to engage in those conversations because you just reach a block where it's just the red herring and the mantra and the sex work is work, and you can recite the statistics and you know all of the, cite all of the different levels of oppression, and it just doesn't seem to get through to people. So I'm looking for some help in how to engage in those conversations and build those alliances and break through some of that real comfort that people use to protect themselves. So look, what have you found useful? Well, one example I can think of was when I was in the UK, a great um, 
Sex trade survivor abolitionist called Sabrina Vallis was over in the UK for a few weeks. She was prostituted from 50, 14, 15 years old um, under prohibition in Australia, legalisation in Australia and decriminalisation in New Zealand. She, at 16 years old, went to the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective, a pro-prostitution lobby group funded by the government, to help get decriminalisation in, which, which it finally did... Um, they finally did succeed in 2003. And she said to them at age 16, I want to get out of the sex trade. And they laughed and said, it's the stigma that's the problem and it's you being arrested that's the problem. Come to our Friday night cheese and wine evening and meet some of the other sex workers' rights activists. You'll be fine. She spent another 25 fucking years in the sex trade. Now, she is now a brilliant activist. She is very open that she wanted decriminalisation because she truly believed it would help her. It came in, it was a disaster, she got out, and she now speaks out. And we were at this debate with these students in a university, and these days, clearly, that means you're privileged, right? Yeah. Didn't necessarily have to, but it does now. And the usual thing about McDonald's came up. And it was one white male student who said, well, I hear what you're saying about all sex, you know, prostitution being exploitative, and and that you shouldn't call it sex work, but isn't all work like that exploitative? And I, we knew what was coming, we just... I think we nodded off and started reading our novels at this stage. <laughs> I worked at McDonald's during the summer months, he said. I got burned with hot fat, I slipped on the floor, the manager was horrible to me, it was a horrible job. So how can you say then that that's any worse than prostitution? And Sabrina said to him, OK, you need some money urgently tonight. You have to have a job. Either go work in McDonald's now or bend over and tech it up the ass. He got it. <laughs> That's all I can say to you. <laughs> Darcy, I've been texted that you're standing there. I can't see you. Okay. Julie, um, what are your thoughts about the way that the proliferation, uh, the, the prostitution lobby and including the proliferation of, of, of pornography have influenced sexuality generally? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question and it's massive and I'll answer very briefly because I know that we don't have a, an awful lot of time left. I promised my friend, our friend and colleague Gail Dines, who's a great prostitution, anti-pornography and anti-prostitution activist who wrote Pornland, a brilliant book. If you haven't read it, do read it. And she said, look, can somebody always mention pornography when you're talking about prostitution? And I've, I've never gone back on my promise because somebody always raises it. Thank God. Okay. <laughs> Be because it's absolutely pertinent. It's just prostitution with a camera. And we know that this is sex education for our youth now. And we know that that just gives men permission to do horrific things to girls and women. When I was in Cambodia, I interviewed a group of women who were currently being prostituted, and they were the most disenfranchised women that I've ever met in, in the sex trade. And they told me that the Johns are turning up now with hardcore pornography on their mobile phones, their cell phones, and saying, do this, I want this. So it's clearly a huge deal. And you cannot possibly look at the sex trade in all of its inglorious spectrum as not having a massive influence on culture. It's driving culture. It's driving it. And this is why it's urgent to speak out about it. Um, Julie, you talked earlier about the importance of language. And... Um, I would like to ask that you and all of us in this room never use the words sex work or sex trade. It is sexual exploitation, it is sexual slavery, it is prostitution. And, and why I'm concerned about it is because we're basically just <laughs> ourselves sanitizing the issue. And I think that it is so, what is, we're only gonna turn this ship around if we start to call every piece of it exactly what it is and keep those words out there and keep saying them to our friends, et cetera, who like to think, well, it's, you know, if a woman wants to sell her body, why shouldn't she uh -huh. be allowed to do that? Uh -huh. um, and uh, I think the other thing is we have to do a lot of um, really public 
um, education around, uh, I mean, individually, writing to the papers or writing op-eds or et cetera, about what is really happening. Um, we had the RCMP, I'm with the University Women's Club, we had the RCMP come and talk to us. And what I think we have to get out there to those middle class, you know, liberal um, thinkers is that where we are at now here in BC, in Vancouver, is that every child is at risk. And that's what, that's what they said to us. The pimps are going to schools, they're looking for vulnerable kids um, because the demand is getting younger and younger. So you tell that to your good friend who lives in her fancy house next door, that her granddaughter or her daughter is at risk, and that's why we have to really rethink where this is going and turn it around. The other piece that I think we need to say to our friends is, um, is it came from Gail Dines, that pornography is now through the internet uh, widely available, easily available to 11, 12, 13 year old boys um, who see it as this is what um, intimate relationships are about. This is what sex is and get to a point where they can't have normal, intimate relationships, and in fact, by the age of 15, are starting to have erectile dysfunction problems. Pass that on to your husbands and your sons um, and see how quickly um, people start to change the culture of what, they're, what they think this is about. Thank you. I want to just read a short passage from, from the conclusion. And please forgive me, because I mention tobacco in this. If anyone's a smoker and they're desperate for a cigarette, <laughs> then you'll just have to bear with me for another five minutes or so. During my research, I met abolitionists within academia, healthcare, the AIDS world, and the LBGT movement. I saw, over the period of two years, the survivor-led abolitionist movement grow and thrive. New books would be published, conferences organized, and laws passed. I write this on the day that the President of the Republic of Ireland signed the Sexual Offences Bill and enshrined the Nordic model in law. The tide is turning. The Nordic model has now been adopted in Sweden, Norway, Iceland, Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and France. The evidence is stacking up against countries that have legalised the sex trade and the much lauded New Zealand model has been exposed as nothing more than a licence for pimps and punters to do as they wish. In Germany, Holland and Australia, survivors are speaking out against the legal brothels into which they were sold. In New Zealand, the truth is emerging about how so-called decriminalisation is no different from the disastrous legalisation approach and that nothing has improved for those who were prostituted under this regime. Those governments, policy makers, service providers and individuals who argue that the sex trade can never be abolished and therefore should be regulated and managed are lacking in imagination. The same attitude is never applied to poverty in Africa, child sexual abuse or cancer. The fight against the tobacco industry is perhaps a good analogy with the campaign to end the normalisation of pimping, brothel owning and sex buying. The message from those pimps and punters that seek to legalise the entire industry is that the sex trade is a harmless industry that causes little or no damage. The rich and powerful tobacco industry held the ground for decades peddling propaganda about how, many, how cigarettes were glamorous and sophisticated, and even convincing many that smoking could cure a cold or a sore throat. In the post-war years, things began to change. Pressure groups were set up as doctors began connecting a range of diseases to smoking. But until they were left with, with little choice, the tobacco profiteers refused to accept those facts and produced their own experts to argue the opposite. As recently as 1994, industry executives were denying to a US congressional committee that nicotine was addictive. But as a result of campaigning by anti-tobacco activists, including many who'd suffered ill health through smoking, civil cases for damage caused by smoking 
began to come to court. That year, the state of Mississippi became the first state to sue the tobacco industry as a way of recovering health costs incurred by smoking-related illnesses. In 1996, President Clinton announced plans to reduce the number of young people becoming smokers, but the following day, five tobacco companies began attempts to block the new regulations. As a result, the industry lobbyists, in an attempt at a nationwide class action, took rather an attempt at a nationwide class action against the industry was dismissed. The effects of passive smoking also came to the fore with a class action brought on behalf of 60,000 non-smoking flight attendants. The industry, which has been aware of the negative effects of tobacco since the 1950s, has long denied what we know to be true. Smoking causes lung cancer and other disease. Smoking has a secondary effect and can cause passive smokers to develop the same illnesses as smokers. Nicotine is highly addictive and advertising promotes smoking as cool and stylish. Today we have legislation banning smoking in countries around the world, as well as health warnings on packaging, a ban on advertising, support to quit smoking and a general change in attitude towards smoking. The combination of legislation and public awareness campaigns has led, in the UK for example, to a massive reduction in numbers of smokers and a normative effect that has resulted in smoking becoming stigmatised and at the same time the increased availability and support for those who wish to kick the habit. If we can achieve this, bearing in mind that smoking is a chronic addiction and the tobacco industry is one of the most rich and powerful industries in the world, then we can do it with the sex trade. There is no addiction involved in the act of paying for sex, only choice. There is no glamour for the women selling sex, only harm. And this analogy is clearly imperfect, but bearing in mind that smoking is addictive and no one needs to pay for sex. There is no such thing as a right or a need for sex. Then I'm sure that we can combine legislation, education and produce a normative effect that has happened in the countries that has criminalised the demand and put the stigma firmly upon those who pimp, upon those who pay for sex and upon those who excuse it. We need to stop letting those off the hook who come out with things like, legalise it, make it safer for the girls. We need to pin them down and say, why? Tell me what you know. Why are you saying that? You're wrong. We need to talk to everybody about this and we need men to tell other men that this is not okay. We don't need men to say, I have a daughter, a sister, a wife. We need them to say, yeah, there are other human beings involved in this and they happen to be women and we can't. Can end the sex trade. Thank you.